I knew I was going to be safe for the video. Uh, I was afraid of what was coming after. Like if you said the wrong thing, he was going to know how to find yeah. you? Yeah, or like, you know, if he if he said something in the video or like I accidentally kept something in the video that he wasn't okay with, then I'm oh. like, oh, me and my entire family lineage are going to be hunted down by oh, the Oh, shit. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. And if you wanna watch this episode completely uncensored, no sponsorship, no ads, click the join button down below to become a member and support this series. But before we get into the episode, I just wanted to throw it out there that we just launched a new show called Assumptions. Last week, we had our trans athletes episode come out. Next week is gonna be our asexuals episode. You're not gonna to wanna to miss that. I'll tell you more about that in just a second, but for now, Let's get to Joey the Anime Man. Joey the Anime Man. That Official is my full name. First and last name. Yep. Do you still go by the Anime Man? Uh, I try not to because <laughs> it's kind of a shit name. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't make that with the foresight of your entire career ahead of you when you came up with that name. Absolutely not. I was probably on drugs when I made it. Like, <laughs> let's be real. How old were you when you made that name for yourself? Um, like 16. Okay. So I have no excuse, basically. So you could make really great life decisions, like um, knowing how to drive a car and yeah. potentially put other people's lives at risk in the United yeah. States. And potentially, you know, run into the thing of. Oh, Oh, two teenagers were killed by the anime man. The anime man. It's like, ugh. Who? For many people, you are the bridge between Western culture and Japanese mm. culture. I guess so, yeah. You've, you've kind of, well, at first you started with more anime-centric stuff, but you've yeah. evolved to be more culture-centric. Yeah. Considering you live in Japan, mm -hmm. and you, you are, would you call yourself a Westerner? Um... I, I guess technically, uh, considering like I was born, I mean, I'm speaking English, so yeah. that's that's for one, but like I was born Barely. in Australia, yeah, yeah, Australian English. It's yes. not really mm. English, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, you know, because I was born in Australia, so, and raised there, so technically I guess I'm a Westerner, but with, I guess, an Asian, East Asian cultural background. Would you say that English is your first language or Japanese is your first language? I say both. Both just to sound cool. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> but do you have like a? Do you, I don't hear so, a Japanese accent when you speak English. Do you have an Australian accent when you speak Japanese? Uh, no, I don't. You have no accent. No. For either language. No. So like it's it's weird because like technically speaking, like the first words that ever came out of my mouth as a child were in Japanese. Oh. So technically speaking, my first language is Japanese. But oh. because I was in Australia, I kind of spoke English as well at the same time. So like my dad would teach me the alphabet while my mom would teach me Japanese, like hiragana and katakana, like pretty much all at the same time. Mm. So my brain was just on overload for like the first like five years of my life, just trying to learn two reading and writing skills that are completely different. Nobody believes me when I say that I'm half Japanese until I start speaking Japanese. Because mm. you look at this face and you're like, there's no way in hell mm. that he can speak Japanese. A lot of people have said I look racially ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Like yeah. I've gotten, the, the most common ones I've got is like Indian, uh, Middle Eastern. Do people say you're Mexican? People Mexican, always people always think I'm Mexican. Mexican, which yeah. I am none of those. Yeah, like at all. Like I'm German, Hungarian, half Japanese. Mm. So it's like I've spent my whole life just being like, I don't know what the hell I am, and people don't know what the hell I am. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of had to like make it a point to be like, okay, when I show my Japanese side, then I'm like showing my Japanese side, and when I'm showing my Australian side, I'm showing my Australian side. You were kind of a child prodigy growing up. You were playing piano at five, playing at the Sydney Opera House. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So were you, did your parents expect you to grow up and be like a, a master musician? Well, I mean, my mom's Asian. Of course she expected great things from me. True. So, yeah, I, I started learning piano at the age of five, um, like classical piano. So I've been playing classical piano for like 20 plus years of my life now. I yeah. played at the Sydney Opera House a couple of times in front of like a thousand people. Sick. Yeah, that was, that was like, pretty standing wild. Standing ovation? Yeah, I think I, if I remember correctly, I was shitting myself on. I was like fourteen. Like I don't, I don't remember. I can't imagine doing that. And then uh, before I started YouTube, I was in like a lot of bands and stuff. Like mm. uh, music was like my main thing. Mm -hmm. um, so like I learned guitar and like taught myself like six other instruments. I loved playing music growing up, and I w I wanted to do music full time. You know, f ever since I was a kid. But I was like, oh, that's not a really realistic job you know that's like a one in a million type of right, thing being yeah. a youtuber now that, yeah yeah and then i became a youtuber job. and i was like oh okay so when did you officially move to japan 
Uh, I moved to Japan seven years ago, so after I graduated university in Australia. And is that when you, you were always interested in Japanese culture, of course, but like, is that when you started transitioning from just being the anime man to to, <laughs> to, to not the anime to, man, to not the anime man, <laughs> to someone who covers Japanese culture and um, kind of shows you know English speakers what Japan is really like? It's weird because like I, I kind of had like three phases in my career. Yeah. So like. The first two and a half years I was in Australia, uh, starting off my YouTube channel, I was uploading daily for two and a half years, which Taking I'm like- Taking the PewDiePie model? Yeah, basically. Cause it's like, back then it was like, okay, so it's like pretty standard that people upload every day if you want to make it on YouTube. And, <sighs> yeah, that was a thing you for know, a while. That was a thing for a while. And mm. I was a full-time uni student at the same time. I don't know if you know about Australian internet speeds, but they're abysmal. Mm. Like they are really bad. I had 0.3 upload speed. Oh. Yeah. And you were uploading every single day? And I was uploading every single day. So what, what would happen is I would go to uni, I would come home in like the evening or whatever, yeah. I would make a bunch of videos, edit them, and then I would start uploading them and go to sleep. And then the next right. morning I would wake up and it might be uploaded. And then mm. the cycle would just continue. Got so it. for two and a half years, my computer was just on full drive mm. every day. So I graduated university. And then I was gonna move to Japan anyway um, mm. to have like a full-time job in Japan as like, uh, I was, cause I was doing web design and stuff like that. Because Dude, I started doing web design. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause you, you uh, designed the Smosh website. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I know, I know the Smosh law. Nice. It's almost like I'm an Anthony Padilla fan or something. So basically I was gonna move to Japan anyway mm. to pursue a career there um, as just like a salary man. And then the day I moved, uh, my computer, just straight up exploded because it was like on for two and a half years, just full mm. running for two and a half years. And then it was just like, I can't do it anymore. And literally burst into flames. Literally? It literally went boom. And then just, there was just smoke coming out of my computer. I didn't know that actually happened like yeah. literally. But at, at that time when I was uploading daily, I was also doing a lot of like gaming videos because obviously like early 2010s, everyone was doing gaming, but I was doing a lot of games uh, and this is kind of how I got my start originally was, do you know the game Corpse Party? No. Okay, so it's basically, it's, it's this indie Japanese game, like horror game. There was a sequel to Corpse Party called Corpse Party 2. And at the time there was no official English translation of it. So the first ever Let's Play I did was this Let's Play of Corpse Party 2, this Japanese only game. And I would play it and I would tr live translate it as I'm playing mm. it. And that got the attention of a lot of people because I was the only one on YouTube who had a playthrough of this game. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people found me through that. And then I would just kind of, you know, cause I was watching a lot of like, you know, obviously like PewDiePie and like Game Grumps and a lot of like gaming channels. So I kind of did gaming while doing the whole like anime, you know, just talking and stuff like that, talking about anime stuff. And then when I moved to Japan, I was like, okay, I'm kind of tired of gaming. I should probably, you know, do what my channel name suggests, which is talking about anime. And so when I moved to Japan, I started making just, just anime content. And then I'd say maybe like two years ago, I was like, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of burnt out from the whole anime thing. Um, I still love it, still watch it, still read it, but like just making content around it was just kind of getting like- To make your entire career. Yeah, <laughs> like it was, you know, I, I thought to myself like, at this day and age, anybody can, watch an anime series, sit on their couch, turn their camera on and talk about it. True. You know, yeah. there is no like, there's there's no level of like mystique or mystery or surrounding the culture anymore because now everyone watches anime. Mm. So I kind of got like bored of that because there was no like sense of mystery left in the community, I guess, from my perspective. And also, you know, just sitting on a couch and just being like, yeah, so this anime that I'm going to be talking about today is a seven out of 10, very good. Right. And then just, rinsing and repeating that, I just kind of got like creatively bored. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, well, people who like anime, who are living in the West, normally are also having an interest in Japanese culture. Right, weebs, and, if you will. Weebs, if you will, right? So like, if you like anime, then you pretty much like Japan. That's like a guarantee, or sure. at least interested in the culture. So I thought like, well, I have a, I would like to think a unique perspective on Japanese culture. I can very much be that person to, discover all sorts of aspects of Japanese culture that aren't necessarily anime related and make people care. And that's kind of like 
the third stage where, where I currently am right now with my channel. You start showing the reality of what Japan, yeah. Japanese culture is really like. Basically, I wanted to tell people that, you know, Japan is not just anime. Right. You know, there are so many other cool, unique, interesting aspects around it, and especially interesting people that re lead kind of interesting lives and, you know, how that relates with the Japanese culture. And it's also, like, good for me because I get to learn more about my culture as well. So it's like a two-way street. True. Um, essentially, I just ripped off your shit, but in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yours is literally called I Spent a Day with the Hub. <laughs> Yeah. Who yeah. did it first? Did you did it? Okay, so I looked this up yesterday. Okay, so okay. you needed to know who, who your, ripped off who. Your first I spent a day with video yeah. was four years ago. Okay? W well, I mean, yes, four and a half. Yeah. But four who's and counting? A half. Yeah. I'm counting because mm -hmm. my first interview was six years ago, so I win. Wait, was it called I spent a day with? Nope. <laughs> okay, well technically my first interview was right when I left Smosh. Okay. And I interviewed other YouTubers. So technically that was five, six years ago. Six, okay, is it coming down to the day It's now? coming down to the day. <laughs> when did you start calling yours I spent today with? Uh, probably after I saw your channel. <laughs> I knew it! Cease and desist, mother... Hey, I got you on camera. Give me the 4K. receipts. Give me the receipts you own that shit. I owned the the com the very common phrase I spent today with. Shit. <laughs> what is the reality of Japanese culture versus the way that people perceive it and the way that you perceived it? I mean, I think the thing that a lot of people perceive about Japan, especially those that are infatuated with like certain cultural standpoints around it, like, you know, I'm a fan of anime or I'm a Nintendo fan yeah. or, you know, I like... Japanese fashion or anything like that. Those that kind of nitpick really cool and interesting points about Japan, I feel a lot of them, whether they like to admit it or not, like to think of Japan as this like utopia on earth, you know, yeah. like the perfect country. Like mm -hmm. the, it's so futuristic. Everything about it is so cool and mysterious and awesome. And it's like another world. And it's like, yeah, you know, Japan in a lot of respects does have a lot of that, especially compared to the West. But the reality of it is Japan has a lot of bureaucratic problems around it. That, you know, culturally it's fallen behind a lot. It does have its problems like any other country, but I think like, you know, depending on what you value in your life, I think Japan can offer a lot of foreigners maybe a better experience compared to where they currently are, mm. you know? Cause I've, you know, I know a lot of people and I've met a lot of like, especially content creators that live in LA, for example, that are just like, man, I really just want to like live in Japan. Yeah, and I'm like, it's idealistic, it's yeah, utopian. Yeah, and it's like, okay, but you're saying that just from visiting Japan because right. visiting Japan and living in Japan is completely different true like you know visiting Japan is amazing you know mm -hmm. I, I don't know a single person who said that they had a bad time in Japan mm -hmm. I think everyone unanimously has a great time in Japan but that's because you're there temporarily once you're there permanently or for a long period of time then you start to see like oh okay I see a problem there that I didn't see so earlier. how long are you in Japan before you start to see these things um like three to six months no, I mean, I kind of went into living in Japan already knowing yeah. that there were like a lot of problems around the society and the culture that were different from, say, Australia. But mm -hmm. I kind of, you know, took, you know, took granted for it just being like, well, you know, yeah, Japan does have some of its problems, but I feel the pros outweigh the cons. It's funny, actually, because at my last place, uh, I got... Uh, a formal complaint. So I, I came home one speaking day. speaking English? Yeah, yeah, no, I came home one day and in my mailbox, there was just this like piece of paper that was sticking in and I was like, oh, what's this? And I pulled it out and it was this like Microsoft Word like written on a computer, clearly Google translated letter mm. from the woman who was living below us at the time in our apartment that I think she said something along the lines of like, your feet stomping at night sound like iron balls hitting the ground. And I'm like, Dog, I'm not even, I'm just walking in my house. Like, what, what, why is there an issue? And, and, and at the end of the letter, she even like threatened being like, if this uh, noise persists, then I'm gonna have to like call the landlord to like talk about it. Is that like a common thing or is that just potentially like Yeah, a because I think like with a lot of like, especially the older generation in Japan who are like unfortunately like a little more xenophobic towards foreigners, I think a lot of them are just like, well, if you don't understand the rules of our country, then we're gonna make sure that you know the rules of our country, whether you like it or not. Mm. And so they're not afraid to, you know, not cause of a conflict, but I guess like show superiority of being mm. like, oh, you're just a foreigner in Japan. You don't know how, what it's like to live here. So when I got this letter, I was like, 
I'll show this mother. And I, I, I decided to write a letter back, but I hand wrote it in perfect Japanese. And I was like, all right. So I basically said like, you know, I apologize, but we work at home because we're YouTubers. Um, instead of calling the landlord, why don't we like meet face to face and we can talk about it and you know, we can discuss this like adults. I put it in the mailbox, never heard from her ever again. They were expecting you not to be able to yeah, respond. Yeah, that, that woman was probably shitting her pants being like, oh, he's Nihongo Jozu. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Did you start tiptoeing around after that or? No, hell no, I got louder. <laughs> I was You're like, like Fuck you, yeah. mother. It's like, I'm paying the rent here, damn it. And just as a reminder, our new show, Assumptions, premiered last week with trans athletes. And this show is a lot like this show, except instead of me interacting with the guests, the guests are all interacting with each other. And next week we have our asexuals episode. Can you tell us more about that? Nicole, Nicole, you might have already seen Nicole. She's been producing for this show for a while and she's in charge of this Assumption show as well. I'm the voice behind the camera in Assumptions and I'm so excited for Asexuals to come out next week. You may remember Lauren and Shelby from our original I Spent a Day With Asexuals where Anthony sat down with them. Shit gets deep. It gets so deep. Do we have any other episodes locked in after Asexuals? Oh yeah, so right now we're gonna have uh, Disney adults come up soon. Ooh and uh, strippers, uh, so be on the lookout. We're gonna be releasing lots of Assumptions episodes very soon. You know what, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get into it. You interviewed Yakuza. I did. Yeah, this guy grilled the shit out of you immediately when you walked into that room. I mean, yeah, I was cosplaying as an anime character. Like, did he, was he like, this guy is just being like an anime character or did he think that's how you really were? I'm not too sure. Uh, I was afraid to ask. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, he clearly, you know, I thought, you know, when, when I first met him, he was like, you know, a b- bit of a friendly fella, you know, even though he looked scary as shit. Uh-huh. I was like, oh, okay, you know, we're just like shaking hands. We're getting to know each other, you know, wanting to know how the flow of the conversation is going to go. So I'm like, okay, this guy's a professional. The moment he sat down and introduced himself, I was like, I'm dead. <laughs> I'm, if I say one thing out of line, this man's going to kill me. You look like me. you were shitting yourself. I was and, absolutely shitting myself. And then he gave you shit for not introducing yourself to him. Yeah. Yeah. He gave me a shit for a lot of things. Yeah. Like, he was like, sit up straight. <laughs> sit up straight when I'm talking to you, mother. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, father. <laughs> Please continue. What, you, you were saying something about stabbing a dude the other day? Were you legitimately scared? Luckily, it was chill. He, yeah. was, he was happy with the video. And thank f- that video did well. Because I was like, I swear, if I put my life on the line and that video flopped, that would have- And then you get uh, killed for a flop video. And then I get killed for At a flop video. At least get killed for like a banger. Yeah. If I was going to be stabbed by Yakuza for anything, then it would've, I would have accepted. It wow, better get at least not even views. Not even a million views. Right. Three million though. Yeah, three million, I'm happy with that. Yeah. I'm totally happy with that. Was that the most scared you were in going into an interview? Uh, into an interview, yeah. Uh, yeah. In terms of in a video, maybe like second. Hmm. The most scared I've ever been in a video is not, it's not actually my video. Do you know uh, Abroad in Japan? Yeah. Yeah, so I do this series with him on his channel called Journey Cross Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, and the scariest moment ever was when we flew in a four person Cessna, which is like a tiny little airplane. Right, just just four seats. Mm-hmm. It's just two in the back, two in the front, and we flew over the most active volcano in all of Japan. Mm. Um, that was scary because this tiny plane is rattling around in the yeah. in the air, and it's just like turbulence on steroids. But what was even scarier is that I found out a week later that that very volcano we flew over erupted. Oh shit! So I was like, oh, I could have. If I was there at the wrong time or wrong place, I could have just straight up died. Uh, the difference is that that is uh, the earth. Well, yeah. this was a man True. in a room. What's scarier? Who knows? <laughs> I think I think, I think think humans are scarier uh, than nature. I agree, I agree. You've also, I mean, you've done interviews with a bunch of different types of people in mm-hmm. Japan. Uh, one that stood out to me was that you interviewed the top YouTuber in Japan. Oh yeah, Hajime. Yeah, and it's super interesting because, I mean, culturally and just everything it feels like everything mm. was different. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the biggest difference between YouTubers in Japan versus YouTubers in the Western world? I think YouTubers in Japan, for one, have no, I guess, idea or interest in wanting to expand outside of Japan. Right. So I think, and and I think that's very uh, kind of unanimous with just the entertainment industry in Japan. I think, you know, w- whether it be like musicians or actors or YouTubers or anything, like any kind of entertainment that comes from Japan, a lot of it tries to market to, I guess, the domestic market. Right. And the international market is kind of a second 
option. So it is pretty insane that he's getting five million, ten million, mm. sometimes fifty million views on his videos, considering yeah. he he is speaking Japanese and he's trying to only appeal to the domestic market. Oh yeah, I mean like this guy is probably like more famous in his own country than like Mr. Beast in America. Wow, that's insane. Like, I don't think there's a single person below the age of 50 in Japan who doesn't know who this guy is. And it's so interesting because very few people outside of Japan even know this guy exists. But also, I think the style and the vibe of the content from Japanese content creators is very different from the Western world. Just culturally? I think culturally, but also like, I think with the way that a lot of it is like edited, I think a lot of uh, like big Japanese YouTubers kind of edit their videos similar to how Japanese TV is edited, which is very different already to how the Western world does it because on Japanese TV, it's like every single thing needs to be subtitled. Mm. And you watch these Japanese TV shows and my YouTuber brain is just sitting there watching it being like, God, I feel so bad for this editor. I think as well, just like some of the ideas that these Japanese YouTubers have, it's like, it's fantastic on paper, but I don't think it would work as well if like a non-Japanese YouTuber did it. It only works because it's Japanese YouTuber making it for a Japanese yeah, audience. Yeah, exactly. And I, I don't know how I can like properly explain it, but it's, yeah. it's just kind of like a vibe I get when I watch it. Well, you you ask, you know, you're like, have you ever considered making videos in English? Mm. You know, and, and he mentioned, you know, he said like if English were more expressive, yeah. a more expressive language that, you know, people might enjoy it, mm. but he's like, they're just the words aren't there. Yeah. And then you also asked about even just having subtitles on screen. He was like, still, the words aren't expressive enough. Yeah, and and I and I kind of get that because, you know, I do a lot of videos in Japanese for an English audience. And sometimes when I'm thinking about what I want to say or how I want to make it be perceived for an English audience, when I'm, you know, kind of coming up with the subtitles and stuff like that, mm -hmm. I there's, there's a couple of moments where I kind of stumble and I'm like, all right, how, I, I knew what I was saying in Japanese, but how can I express fully what I was saying in Japanese to English? For example, you know, there are a lot of Japanese words that is just a singular word in Japanese that needs an entire sentence in English. Mm. So like a good example is uh, there's a Japanese word, uh, which is komorebi. Mm -hmm. uh, and the English translation is the light coming through the leaves of a tree. Oh, I thought that was dappling. Dappling? Dapple. Dappling? Dappling? Is Dapple, that a word dappled for Dappled light? Is that a word? Is it dappled light? I don't know. I'm not English good. I'm not English good? No, I'm not English good. I'm not Japanese good. Uh, and that's why I think uh, English speakers learning Japanese is like one of the hardest things to do. Right. Because I think when we, ha when we learn a new language, our first instinct is to try and think of it as a direct translation right. of what we're currently used to. Mm -hmm. But because Japanese as a language is so grammatically different and it's like constructed different in terms of how sentences are structured and how you bring your point across in a conversation that when you try to directly translate it in your head from English to Japanese, it sounds weird in Japanese. Mm. And I think that's why like a lot of say like English uh, entertainment content is very difficult to translate into Japanese. Do you think one language is easier or more difficult to make jokes in or to be funny uh, in? I think English is easy to make jokes in. Why? Because uh, we have because we have irony. Japan does not have irony? No. <laughs> what? We, we, we don't have like, you know, with a lot of English, we have like reading between the lines type of jokes. Yeah. You know, like maybe the way that we accentuate certain words, adds different underlying context so to just even emphasis on certain yeah. words. I mean, and like, you know, because I, I remember, for example, like, you know, we do this a lot when we mean to be sarcastic about something. Yes. Exactly. I'm doing I an totally, interview. I totally understand what you mean. I did that once in front of my Japanese cousin and she went, what's this? <laughs> because in Japan, we don't have that. We don't have this movement to oh, mean- Sarcasm. Mean sarcasm. Oh. And, and Japan just doesn't have that. Do they, you're not telling me that there's no sarcasm. There, like, is, sarcasm, there is sarcasm, but it's not a common way to express comedy. I feel like sarcasm is so common that I have friends where conversations will be 50% sarcasm. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm from Australia. We speak sarcasm fluently. Oh, true. I feel like Australia is an even more sarcastic 
uh, has even more of a sarcastic culture than yeah. even American culture. Oh yeah. So so you're you're oscillating constantly between a hundred percent sarcasm and one percent sarcasm. One percent. Yeah. So what's that like communicating with your friends and trying to show that you're like buddy buddy in Japan with people? Um, one aspect that we have in Japanese that I think not a lot of other languages have, especially English, is the difference between formal and informal. Mm. So in English, how you talk to your friends is in a lot of aspects the same way as how you would talk to your boss, right? Well, the same words. Same words, right? You yeah. know, but like, you know, obviously with a, a veil of, you know, uh, sensibleness, you know, uh, when you're talking to your boss, right? Yeah, with a smirk, smile, have the half, with a friendly, with a business smile. smile. Yeah, the business yeah. smile, exactly. Yeah, I totally, yeah. I, I respect what you do. I respect <laughs> what I do here. I love my job and I love your job. He's smiling. <laughs> But like, you know, we have that in English. Whereas in Japanese, we have formal Japanese and informal Japanese. Right. And the difference is that the words we use are completely different. Right. In English or in American English, you just throw the word yeah, in yeah, the yeah. middle of your sentence. Yeah. And that's the different language. But like in Japanese, it's like how I would talk to my mom is I would use a completely different set of vocab. As compared to someone like, say, my teacher or my boss or someone who's in a higher social hierarchy than I am. Mm -hmm. Because Japan operates on like a social hierarchy. If you're in school, for example, like high school, like your seniors would be like your superiors because they're older than you. By the way, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. This time of year can be a lot and it's natural to feel some sadness or anxiety about it. Whether or not you're looking forward to the holidays, adding something new and positive can help counteract feelings of unhappiness. Therapy can be a bright spot amid all the stress and change, something to look forward to to make you feel grounded and to give you the tools to manage everything that's going on. I've been a huge proponent of therapy for a while now and I started going about six years ago and it's helped me in almost every facet of my life. Whether dealing with anxiety or depression or the holiday blues, therapy has been a guiding light for me. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Padilla. And this episode is also sponsored by Rocket Money. In this day and age, it seems like you can't just buy things anymore. You can only subscribe to them. There's subscriptions for everything, like streaming services and razors and fitness programs and pet food. There's even a bacon of the month club. <laughs> it's no wonder it can feel impossible to keep tabs on what you're paying for every month. That's why I'm a huge fan of Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and also helps you lower your bills all in one place. With over 5 million users and counting, Rocket Money has helped save its customers an average of $720 a year and $1 billion in total savings so far. Stop wasting money on things you don't use, cancel your unwanted subscriptions, and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash Padilla. That's rocketmoney.com slash Padilla. Rocketmoney.com slash Padilla. Now back to the world of Joey the Anime Man. What kind of elements or what kind of things do you feel like you bring that invites your guests in Japan to be more vulnerable? I don't really do anything special per se. Um, my girlfriend has said like, the one thing that I'm really good at is making strangers feel welcome mm. and like making strangers or people I'm meeting for the first time just be like, oh yeah, I can be comfortable with this person. Yeah. Because yeah. I think I'm, I'm, I'm a very no bullshit person. Like mm -hmm. what you see out of me is what you get. And if you like it, then cool, we, yeah. can, we can hang out. But if you don't like it, then I'm not offended. I'm not going to change myself for you, mm -hmm. you know, so. You, know, you can't please everyone with that, but I feel like I'm very good with just, you know, being like, just acting myself and being like, you know, there's nothing to worry about. I'm not hiding anything. This is this is who I am. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you can do the same for me and, you know, just like kind of open yourself up to me as much as I'm opening up to you, then we can have a great time. And I think you present a genuine curiosity too mm -hmm. that doesn't feel like it's shrouded in judgment. 
Yeah, so I, I feel mean, like that's invited. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very open-minded. You know, the whole reason why I love interviewing uh, all sorts of different people in in Japan is because I'm genuinely curious about like, oh, okay, you're you're an ex Yakuza member, like. I want to know what your life is about because mm-hmm. that's super interesting to me. You can say anything you want and I won't judge you because mm-hmm. I just genuinely want to know what this side of the world is like because I have no clue. And I want to be able to, you know, uh, I guess explore those concepts and present it in a way to my audience that will make them want to be curious as well. When I was watching your interview with Hajime, he showed his house. Mm. And it looks pretty lonely in there. It's so massive. Yeah. I got this feeling of loneliness. Not mm. to say that he was, I don't know mm. him at all, but. Oh, he has like seven staff living with him. Oh, okay. So he's not like lonely, lonely per se, but I mean, it is true that in Japan, I think uh, the whole loneliness problem is very prominent. Is it a um, problem? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for one, you know, uh, there's been studies shown that just Japanese youths of today are getting less and less interested in being in relationships or getting married or having children. And then you have, you know, that on top of the aging population crisis and the low birth rate crisis. And there's just a whole bunch of like social cues that are not up to snuff in Japan. And then, you know, on top of that in Japan, you know, I think foreigners who live in Japan feel a very strong sense of loneliness while there as well because of this kind of hidden agenda against foreigners in Japan and Mm. this kind of xenophobic overtone that I think a lot of the older generation still has in Japan. Do you feel that? Are you lonely over there? Um, I... (laughs) Your voice got so high Uh, that I'm gonna take uh, that... (laughs) I'm gonna take that as a... Maybe. Maybe. I I don't... I, I think like... It definitely helps that I know the language. Um, I think the, the the one problem with that a lot of foreigners face in Japan, that you know that do feel lonely, is that there is that language barrier, mm. um, and it goes both ways. Like I think foreigners are scared to interact with Japanese people, and Japanese people are scared to interact with foreigners. Mm. And I think there is this rift that is created between the two cultures that is a cause of the loneliness, or I guess is a direct result of the loneliness. Um, Because I think foreigners in Japan are just as lonely as Japanese people in Japan. If they could come together to help each other out and be more open-minded with each other, then I think the loneliness issue could be resolved. But I think just inherently with how Japanese society operates and how, I guess, the, uh, you know, the whole fact that Japan is a collectivist society, um, and, you know, just wants to kind of, the, the whole point of living in Japan is just kind of like, you stay in your lane, you are a cog in the machine, and nothing will be a problem to you. Mm-hmm. And if you try to step out, if you try to show any amount of individualism, or, you know, just, I'm not going to be part of the system, bro, like that kind of mentality, then you're kind of socially ostracized mm. from everybody else. And Got that it. could lead to just even further loneliness. I feel until you know, Japanese people are like kind of learnt to be, that it's okay to be more open-minded, it's okay to show individualism and express yourself and there be no social um, consequences for it, then I think that's the moment where Japan can finally catch up. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's a double-edged sword because if Japan becomes like the rest of the world, then the mystique of Japan is going to disappear. Mm. Because I think that's the one thing that's making Japan so unique in this day and age is that we are so good at maintaining culture and tradition Mm. better than any other country so what's i mean mean, you do have a clothing brand yes you know you you did launch your own clothing brand you you got that drip you got that no nonsense kind of brand yeah i mean i know that you're trying to like not put all your eggs in one basket but Mm. is that kind of where you're hoping to go is is follow through with with more clothing um i think like you know I, i always get asked the question of like you know, what, where do you see yourself in five years? Where mm-hmm. do you see yourself in ten? I think we all get questions like sure. that, right? Especially at a convention. Um, and every time I just have to be like, I don't know, because I've been doing YouTube 10 years now. And if you had asked me 10 years ago where I would be in 10 years, I wouldn't have said here. Right, and if you had come up with a concrete plan, yeah, you also wouldn't have been I here. I also wouldn't have been here. So I think like my, you know, my whole philosophy with YouTube is that it's, it's one of those industries that is so unpredictable because it's new it's so unstable because of the nature of how we make money that what's stopping us from just being like this time next year you're not doing this anymore like you are just irrelevant 
yeah. and it's happened with like countless people. Right? Yeah, um, it's like it's a it's a miracle that you or I have survived for this long. I mean, yeah. maybe not for you, but for me, no, it's a miracle. No, dude. for me, no, you're an OG. You can shut up. Oh yeah, it's almost 18 years though, dude. Yeah, that's but, crazy. Yeah, exactly. But like, even just that is like. I don't think anyone has expected that, and I don't think anyone has the foresight to be like, I can see myself doing this for the next like 40 years of my life, right? No. Because no. no one knows that. No, and we've seen platforms come and go. Yeah. I mean, YouTube feels like it's gonna be here forever because it yeah. has been around for 18 years. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't know how anything's gonna change. The, even the algorithm being introduced killed off a bunch of yeah. YouTubers. Like, YouTube could make a decision tomorrow that kills off half the YouTube current. could make a decision tomorrow where they're like, you know what? long form content, we're just doing YouTube shorts now. Yeah. And at that point it's like, well, all right, we're, we're all screwed. When the algorithm was introduced, they did the opposite. They said F short form content, yeah. F anything under 10 minutes, we're doing it long Exactly. Style. So it's like, it's so unpredictable with the way this industry is operating. So when I was reflecting on my life, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm 28, moving on to 29 right now. Old. Yeah, I know. How old are you? 35. It's all right. I, I hope to look that good at 35. Almost 36. Damn, you're, you're approaching your 40s, bro. Dude, I'm getting into my late 30s. Sheesh. Yeah. But, you know, I, I thought to myself, like, okay, can I see myself making content at age 40 or age 50 or age 60? And I thought to myself, maybe, but there might also be a point where I'm just like, I'm kind of bored of this. There's, there's nothing more creatively that I want to do in this format that is YouTube. So then what do I do? The whole reason why I'm doing my clothing stuff and like all of the other side projects that I've done throughout my career and are planning to do is to kind of like create these nets that will hopefully catch me if one falls through. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of had that whole philosophy my whole life of like, there's nothing, there are no consequences to making too many backup plans. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, it's, it's always a good idea to do because you never know what's gonna happen in your life. You know, what's stopping me from trying out these other creative ventures like starting a clothing brand or you know doing voice acting or doing music or you know whatever it is that i want to do why why would i not at least attempt to do it and if it doesn't work out then it doesn't work out i can just move on to the next thing mm -hmm. i still have youtube there as my full-time occupation why would i not utilize the time and the energy and the, the and the expendable income that i have now to just try and do as many things as i can in my life while i can and once again, we just launched our new show, Assumptions, last week with trans athletes. And next week, we're gonna have asexuals on. And you should go check that out immediately, right this second. Click it now. I'm just gonna sit here until you click it. It's good. Why are you still here? You were supposed to have clicked that so long ago.